Coming up on Market to Market. Republican senators call out USDA over ethanol. Hay exporters continue their recovery from a dockside dispute. And market analysis with Don Rose next. Greenside to uh, uh, put on new, new negative. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company, offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, July 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. Your day-to-day -day economic situation may have you concerned about the future, but many business owners are shaking off concerns about weakness in global growth. The Labor Department says 224,000 jobs were created last month. Unemployment climbed a tenth of a percent to 3.7 percent as more people started looking for work. New jobs notwithstanding, the lure of cheaper overseas goods widened the trade gap in May by 8.4 percent to $55.5 billion. The Mid-America Business Conditions Index continues to show economic growth across the nine states surveyed despite weaker farm income. On Friday, the EPA proposed an increase in the amount of biofuels that must be blended by refiners in 2020. The new rule increases the mandate to just over 20 billion gallons but holds conventional ethanol use at 15 billion gallons. The news brought the ire of farm trade groups looking for an increase in the predominantly corn-based fuel. The news was piled on top of complaints about blending waivers granted to refiners. Peter Tubbs has more. A turf war has broken out in Congress over who has input over issuing small refiners exemptions, or SREs, that are issued by the Environmental Protection Agency. A dozen senators from oil-producing states sent a letter to the White House arguing that Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue's involvement in the SRE issue is potentially illegal. The Clean Air Act authorizes only the administrator, in consultation with the Secretary of Energy, to act on petitions from small refineries. Thank you very much, Iowa. We love Iowa. Thank you very much. The White House appeared ready to dial back the exemptions after an appearance by President Trump at a June 11th ethanol plant event in Iowa. Major oil refiners like Chevron and ExxonMobil have received flack for gaining SREs to cover their smallest refineries. The ethanol industry has been pressing both Secretary Perdue and President Trump to stop issuing exemptions as it reduces the demand for ethanol. Oil interests want an increase in the exemptions, claiming that requiring the blending of ethanol into gasoline puts small refineries at economic risk when margins are tight. According to Emily Score, CEO of the ethanol trade association Growth Energy, the issuing of small refinery exemptions has reduced ethanol consumption by 2.6 billion gallons. Speculation the Trump administration will reduce the number of SRE waivers has driven the price of renewable identification numbers or RINs higher. One RIN is generated for each gallon of biofuels that is created. RINs can be purchased by crude oil refiners to allow them the ability to eliminate their obligation to mix ethanol into their output of the nation's gasoline supply. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Earlier this week, USDA announced that prevent plant takers will be eligible for the next round of market facilitation payments if farmers plant a cover crop. After a spring that kept many planters idle, grain farmers welcomed the relief in the face of lost export opportunities. The loss of markets can happen in an instant, 
either through trade disputes or labor disagreements. A few years ago, Western hay growers got caught up in a dockside dispute that devastated their markets. Colleen Bradford Kranz has more in our cover story. In the summer of 2014, West Coast hay producers were well into their harvest season when contract negotiations between port workers and ship owners fell apart. For those growing alfalfa and other hay varieties for export, news of closures and labor slowdowns at 29 ports along the West Coast had producers listening carefully. Even, indeed, even a financial hit for some companies, but on the macro sort of level where we look at the winners and the losers, overall, it doesn't really mean all that much for the U.S. economy or even here in Southern California. as, I, as it Those growing hay for export disagree with assessments that downplayed the impact of the nine-month labor dispute. By then, many forage producers in California, Washington, and Oregon had taken a major financial hit particularly those trying to get their products to international buyers in Asia and elsewhere. That was a very difficult time for exporters here in the Imperial Valley or anywhere on the West Coast. We couldn't ship anything out. We had standing orders. Marcel Van Dyke, marketing manager for the Port of Los Angeles, said the resulting congestion at the ports was especially hard for those with hay or other perishable products. Some you cannot store too long, uh, or it is very expensive to store in cold storage. If you cannot ship it to the market, quality deteriorates, and then you don't get your, your premium uh, price in, in the foreign market. So it is uh, very hard for, for the supply chain uh, to deal with those disruptions. Golden Eagle Hay, a Calipatria, California-based grower, began exporting alfalfa pellets out of the Imperial Valley in 1963, long before many other producers in the area. By 1980, the company had shifted to bales compressed for transport in shipping containers. Today, many others have joined them in trying to supply the Asian market with forage. John Berker, Golden Eagle's general manager, says some of their longtime customers had to turn elsewhere when the company, which now buys 80% of the hay it sells, was unable to get animal feed delivered on time because of labor disputes at the port. So we were not able to ship over there to Japan. This is just one example for Japan. So the cattle and the, um, and the dairy cows have to eat. So what Japan did was that they went and bought Timothy from Canada and Australian oat hay instead because um, they had to feed their animals. Those in the hay export business were suddenly stuck storing the old hay crop as the new season approached. Some turned to nearby dairies and horse ranches, matching or undercutting domestic prices in hopes of emptying their storage sheds. According to USDA, hay prices across the country dropped by 25 percent between 2014 and 2016 with steeper declines along the West Coast. Those who grew primarily for domestic customers also began to feel the pinch as the market flooded with hay originally bound for other ports of call. Well, anytime you have an oversupply, you know the price will drop. Domestic dairymen, any dairyman, any cattle guy, they're, they're pretty smart. And if they have uh, offers for cheap fiber, they'll change their menu or change their ration. The same scenario was playing out farther north in Washington and Oregon, where the ports were affected by the same labor negotiations. Hay exporters were reluctant to use truck or rail due to the slower delivery time that could leave customers waiting in Asia with a dwindling feed supply. The labor dispute was finally settled in February of 2015, but the ports needed several months to return to business as usual. While Golden Eagle weathered the storm, in part because of major customers from Japan and Taiwan who remained loyal, it took much longer for hay prices to rebound. But at least we had a home for it. Some, a lot of guys didn't have a home for it. They didn't have the relationships that, that we have, that we've built over 20 years. U.S. hay exports had continued to show signs of growth until last year, 
as some customers returned to their original suppliers. But exports slipped in 2018 as the U.S.-China tariff battle grew. A decision in Saudi Arabia to reduce water use by cutting forage production helped prevent a greater backslide. One Saudi Arabian company went so far as to buy land in the Imperial Valley to grow its own hay. The traditional markets were always Japan and Korea because they still have cows and, and, and all, all the other animals there, but they didn't have enough land to cultivate food for them. But you see now also uh, more the Middle East is coming up. An unusual agreement to extend the new labor contracts at West Coast ports from 2019 to mid-2022 may have contributed to overseas customers having increased confidence in U.S. producers. Most of that cargo uh, is, is coming back after the, uh, the, the actions are winding down. And now with an extension of the contract, uh, that, that gives a lot of uh, trust in, in, the, in the West Coast again. Despite the good news, the major hay exporters working 200 miles away in the Imperial Valley are unwilling to get caught in the middle again. Most are making contingency plans. It was definitely a difficult time. This one hurt. It really did. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Even with uncertainty over acres and the hope of progress in the ongoing trade war with China, the grain markets were mixed. For the week, September wheat dropped 12 cents while the nearby corn contract bumped 14 cents higher. USDA's concern their numbers don't reflect what's really out there countered optimism over progress in Chinese trade talks. The August soybean contract plummeted 29 cents. August meal lost 9.50 per ton. December cotton gained 74 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, August class three milk futures added 33 cents. Livestock was in the green. August cattle put on 265. August feeders expanded $1.98, and the August lean hog contract rose $1.05. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index flew 118 ticks higher. August crude oil shed 22 cents per barrel. COMEX Gold dropped 11.10, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost half a point to finish at 4.23 even. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Great to be back. Thank you. Happy late 4th of July to you. I know you've got some uh, patriotic colors on there today. We can talk about that a little more in Market Plus. But Don, we had a holiday-shortened week this week. Tell me what happened here in the aftermath of last Friday's report, which shocked the trade. Well, last week's report was uh, a shocker last Friday and, you know, really put the market down 25 cents down the limit on corn at one time. The trade uh, instantly didn't believe the numbers, but I here to tell you that you have to really trade the numbers, whether you believe them or not. Then uh, we came back a carryover into this week on some selling, but then as we hit the end of the week, a uh, holiday, we had some evening up and we ended the week higher. So I think when you look at it, it's a market that uh, wants to believe that the numbers aren't right, but at the same time, uh, the crop conditions are probably improving on corn and soybeans. So you're in kind of a, a trading range market. Okay, let's talk about the crop conditions when you look at the winter wheat. We've seen only 30% of that crop harvested. Usually this time it's nearly 50% on average. Will this add a little bit of premium into the market? Well, the crop ratings actually went up last week, which is really uh, seasonally, you just don't do that. As you mature, you usually go the other way. I think what that really says is the yields are probably bigger than you think. And that's really the report that we're getting is that massive yields, even on grazed uh, wheat, we've had some big yields. So I think when you look at it, we're probably this next week, we're probably going to be close to 40, 45 percent harvested and a lot of wheat coming at us. You know, hard red winter wheat, you know, just amazing. It's running at a discount, 65, 70 cents to uh, soft red wheat uh, with the issues with the wet weather in the, in the uh, soft wheat, but uh, big premium difference. Okay, big premium difference. Don, let's talk now about the corn markets. July 3rd, we saw a pretty good recovery from that report you mentioned last Friday. Why did we see that happen on Wednesday? 
Well, I think when you really look at it, we had a, a 53 cent break on, on corn in just very short order. And overall, the fundamentals on the corn market, the trade is very mixed. Not sure really what what we have. Uh, the ranges run from a, a 1.1 billion carry out, a billion carry out, all the way up to 2 billion. Probably uh, in the Thursday report that's coming up July 11th, it's probably going to be a bit of a, a bearish because the uh, the uh, WASDE is going to use the NAS numbers. Remember, there's a real confusion. WASDE took corn acres in the June report down 3 million. Then NAS came out with the June plantings and they took it down just 1.1 million acres. But uh, overall, I think what you have, uh, Delaney, really is a wide swinging market. You get down to 420, uh, you start to see end user buying went to 420 and a half this week and scale down buying just because of the uncertainties that we have from end user. But then fundamentals are actually a, a bit negative on corn, if you believe the numbers, which I think you have to trade. Um, you know, you get up around 450. Uh, and higher, it's really a tough sled again to the upside. So I'd call it a range bound market, 410, 420 on the downside, 445, 455 on the upside. And I think we're gonna be pushing back and forth in that watching the crop ratings as we go forward for better direction. We're gonna resurvey these acres again for the August 11th report. So you're gonna keep the trade increasingly nervous. And then if you look at the lateness of the corn crop, just incredibly late. I don't think we've ever had one this late. So you're gonna have to beat uh, the frost uh, scare as we get close to the fall. Absolutely. Don, the other thing I wanted to ask you about here was cash has remained relatively strong. I've seen on Twitter this week, guys have said basis has been really strong. Really, it looked like across the Corn Belt. Why is cash remaining so strong with these acre numbers that we've seen and they're not maybe listening to those numbers as you mentioned they should? Well, I think what you really have in the U.S. is you have a domestic issue. Um, there's no shortage of grain or no shortage of corn in the world market. It's really domestic uh, only. And so what that means is you're going to have sh uh, regional shortages of corn, particularly over in the eastern corn belt. You know, we have uh, 70 uh, cent overs already at some of these ethanol plants. And what happens with the market, typically you push up. We're going to have dislocated corn that you're going to have to try and pull from all different regions. It's really going to be an eastern corn belt versus a western corn belt dislocated location, but you're also going to have dislocations in the western Corn Belt. You get into some of these synergies in the South Dakota, you know, in that region, you're going to run into the same issue. So um, from a producer standpoint, that means there's going to be opportunities to watch the basis, get some good pushes as you go through the year, but you have to have some risk management on to take advantage of those because it may not be, uh, it may be in the cash market and the basis versus the board. We talk the futures market a lot, but it all comes back down to the cash market and the basis. Okay. Don, I've got a, one final question here as we talk about corn acres. We heard Under Secretary Bill Northey report this week that he's expecting as many as 10 million prevent plant acres. So I've got a twofold question for you. One, what do you think the acreage breakdown will be for that approximate 10 million prevent plant acres? And do you think that that number is on the money or too high, too low? Well, when you look at it, you know what he said, if you stop and look at it in the last report, the overall planted acres from uh, last year were actually down 10.4 million acres. So we've lost a lot of acres. Where did they go? Uh, 4.6 million came out of uh, soybeans, 1.1 million came out of corn. And you know, realistically, you're probably, history shows that you don't drop these acres, those big numbers going into uh, the final, more like two to three million on corn, I would say an extra, maybe another two million on soybeans. So there's another uh, four or five million. So there you go. Those are the acres, Delaney. So uh, that's why I think what he was talking, 10 million prevent plant acres, not that far off when you add everything up. And is that what you're expecting to see, or do you think we'll see something a little higher than that? No, I think that's probably what we have dialed in. But not just corn prevent plant acres. It's prevent plant acres on total crops, I think, is what you're really looking at, you know, counting the soybeans and everything else. Okay. Don, as I mentioned, it was 4th of July. You're looking very patriotic today. We've got a question specifically related to the 4th of July date. We've got Gary Bruns from Wilton, Iowa, sent in a question. He said, the saying goes that how the markets close the Friday before the 4th compared to the Friday after the 4th will set the prices for the fall. So how high will, file, will fall prices go in your professional opinion? 
Well, one, that's a good question. Number two, uh, I think when you look at it, history's really been distorted this year because the planting is way late, way off. So I would throw off some of those things. But I think the thing that we do know, uh, and I think you can look at this very close, is we're probably in a short crop year. In a short crop year, what happens uh, traditionally is you put your highs in in the fall, not in the, uh, you know, usually you're putting your lows in in the fall, simply because as you start harvest, you find out the yields really aren't there. Odds are that's what happens uh, this year. But seasonally right now, and you can see what's happened is the market's really, really struggling. Uh, rallies, uh, you know, can't really hold. And that's because the seasonalities is one of the biggest negative seasonalities of the year from now until actually about the 1st of October on soybeans and from now until about the middle of August on corn, you've got wheat harvest coming at you, you know, record yields down there. You've got Brazil corn harvest is about 35% done. You've got wheat coming at you from uh, Europe and from uh, Russia and the Ukraine. So what I'm saying is there's just a lot of grain coming at you in the market. And remember, there's no shortage of old crop. The issue is domestic and it's out into a new crop. And then remember, next year, probably the acres bounce back pretty big on corn. So you have to keep that in mind. So seasonalities, I would say, are distorted, but uh, seasonality is probably coming into play here again. Okay, Don, let's talk about the July 11th report. When it comes to the soybean markets in particular, do you see USDA adjusting the yield on next week's report? Well, you know, that's a good question because I tell you what, there's going to be some big adjustments. Number one, uh, remember, they're going to take the corn, uh, the bean acres down 4.6 million. So that's what, 225 million off of a billion bushels. So instantly you're down to, um, you know, a lower figure then they're probably going to take the yield down because the crop ratings are 54% good to excellent. Historically, that five-year average is 68. So to have trend line yields probably doesn't make sense. They're probably going to take the yield down one bushel or two bushels a, an acre uh, instantly. I don't know if they're going to do anything on corn. But instantly, rather than a billion carry out, you're talking about a carry out probably six to 700 million. So not that that's a bullish figure, but the crop's getting smaller, not bigger. Yeah, that, I'm, it's not necessarily bullish, but it sounds like we're starting to move back towards that direction. Don, what do you expect then to see as an immediate reaction to that report, assuming all those factors line up? Well, I think we're going to see in a trading range because they're, uh, the carryout's big enough to go past 920, 930 on November. Bean's going to be very hard. To take the market anytime soon under 840 to 860 is probably hard because you have to just a huge respect for what can happen with the lateness of this crop. That's probably the biggest single thing that we have going forward now. I know we have pollination in corn and we have pod filling in soybeans, but realistically, it's going to be tough. We're going to have to beat Mother Nature and uh, it, you know, you're going to have some of this corn that is not going to reach black layer stage until the third week of October. Think about it, almost the first of November. I mean, is that possible. I mean, it's, I think as you get into August, you'll hear a big debate on that. Okay. Well, that, we'll continue that in Market Plus. And we've got to talk about the live cattle and feeder cattle markets. There's seeming to be a premium built in in the live cattle markets. You look at the spreads, you look at what's going on in the later deferred contracts. Why is this happening? Why is this being factored in now? Well, you know, I think when you look at the cattle had a good trade here to end the week. It, uh, you know, we're in an uptrend. The cash market traded uh, basically uh, higher this week. We had some 113.50 in the corn belt, and, you know, that was a good sign. But, you know, the futures market just got too low, Delaney. Uh, the typical seasonal bre top to the bottom would have put, you know, we had about 129, 130 for the top in the spring cash cattle. That means the low should be around 109 in that area for a summer low. And we took uh, August futures down to almost 103 at one time, close at 107. So I think we just got too low. Uh, even the government says the uh, first quarter of next year, we're supposed to have uh, cash cattle at 125. So even tonight, we close at 116. So um, looks like there's a little more upside. The cattle are trying to break to the upside. We'll see if they do or not, but it's all up to the demand. And in the feeder cattle markets, have we put in a low there? And are we starting to break out of this range? Or do you expect us to continue doing some range bound here in the August feeders? Well, the feeder cattle are just sitting down at the bottom end of the range. They followed the fat cattle down. But it's all about the corn market. It's all about the inputs. It's all about the break-evens on cattle going forward. If you can get the back months to move up, uh, in the cattle, cash, uh, live cattle. And if you can get the corn to come back down a bit, I think feeders will find some support. Okay, Don, your quick thoughts here. How much lower are we going to head in the lean hog markets or do we have support at these levels? Supplies are just playing too big. I mean, our slaughter was 6.5% uh, over a year ago. Our production 10% over a year ago uh, last week. 
too big. Without, uh, without China, without Asia coming at the market with African swine fever, I think you have to be afraid fall hogs go to $50. But that can change if we get some demand. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a little bit more about that in Market Plus. Don Rose, thank you so much. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get notified when the program and Market Plus are online. Find us at Market to Market. Join us again next week when we'll explore how the next generation is learning the art of the hedge. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.